can you actually share the screen and uh, you can start our uh, the next speaker is our good friend step uh, nidenge from uh, ifar rwanda please share your screen and uh, the floor is for you okay so um, um good morning good afternoon to everyone um i'm steve ndenge from the east african institute for fundamental research here in kigali and i would like to talk about some of the research work we are doing at the condensed condensed matter group here at bifa so just this is just a tiny sample of what we're doing also, I'm going to take you out of uh, materials and liquids for a short while and talk about the system in the gas phase. I, I've seen the schedule of the meeting and I've seen very little uh, mention about uh, processes uh, occurring in gas phase. And I guess and I believe it's also some kind of important part of the physics community in Africa. So initially I was expecting to talk about the UV and infrared absorption spectrum of uh, nitrogen dioxide and uh, um, water dimer, but I realized that 20 minutes would be a little too short to be um, very exhaustive on those two topics. So I would just focus on some recent results we've had on the nitrogen and dioxide that are yet to be published. So, First of all, the, the, the question is uh, why, uh, why are we interested in nitrogen dioxide? So for people who are not in the molecular physics community, nitrogen dioxide has been a very popular and uh, a prototype for understanding a lot of physical processes like unique molecular dissociation in molecules, understand conical intersection, or even quantum control in some uh, specific system. And for more than 15 years, it has been the main focus of uh, research for people working in molecular physics. Um, as a small anecdote, my PhD advisor spent almost 60% of his research career just looking at this specific system um, experimentally. Uh, nitrogen dioxide is also a very important trace gas in the Earth's atmosphere, so it plays a role in absorbing sunlight and therefore contributes to the Earth's um, energetic budget. It also contributes in re regulating the chemistry in the troposphere, so the dissociation of NO2 usually produces an oxygen atom that can be involved in other secondary processes in the atmosphere. Last but not least, uh, NO2 as well as many NOx are very involved in combustion processes. NO2 in particular is used as an oxidizer in rocket fuel. And I may come back a little about that later. So we have our target. We want to be able to study the NO2 molecule. The, the idea is how are we going to do that? What kind, what framework, what tools are we going to use to do those type of study? So for this specific, uh, molecule for this specific system. The process we are going to use is what is known as molecular quantum dynamics. So I will first start to introduce that uh, uh, method, that approach for those who are not familiar with it, specifically with respect to what I'm going to present. So it won't be the most general and, and exhaustive description of molecular quantum, quantum dynamics, but what just a specific uh, area um, related to the tools I'm using. And then I'm going to present you some of our results on the photo absorption of NO2. So molecular quantum dynamics, the starting point of understanding this process is the molecular Hamiltonian, where you have the kinetic energy of the nuclei, the electron, then the Columbian interaction between the nuclei, the electron, and the nuclei, and the, the electron. So because this type of equation cannot be solved, um, Analytically, in a sim analytically at all, uh, a lot of approximations are usually made. And the most common one is what is known as the von Oppenheimer approximation. And this approximation allows you to separate the motion of the electron from the motion of the nuclei. So when you are separating the two motion, you can solve what is known as the electronic Schrodinger equation. The solution of this equation, when um, 
the energy solution are interpolated, generate what is known as the potential energy surface. And you have uh, two examples of potential energy surface on the left. You have on the on top uh, one dimensional potential energy surface, often called potential energy curve. And on the bottom, you have another uh, type of potential energy surface that is a multi dimensional one. So what do you learn from the solution of the electronic Schrodinger equation? You can learn about the structure of the molecule. You can learn about the electronic magnetic optic properties of the molecule or even of the material. So usually there are two big uh, type of methods that are used for this solution. There are wave function based methods that are mainly post method methods and there are methods that are based on density uh, functional theory. So usually the wave function based methods are more accurate but scale poorly with the size of the system. On the other side, density-based, the methods are usually slightly less accurate and not always reliable um, for specific processes, but scale much better with the size of the system. And there are many codes that are available, some are commercial, some are academic, to solve this kind of problem. So you have, for example, more Pro, you have Quantum Espresso, you have Gaussian, and among other, other codes. So what do we do? Once we are able to solve the electronic energy equation, we obtain what is known as the potential energy surface. When you have the potential energy surface, you can now start thinking, how do the nuclei move in the cloud that is generated by the electron? So the electron creates some kind of surface in which the nuclei start to move around. So there are two ways of solving the problem. You can use a classical way to solve the problem, which is uh, often uh, referred to as molecular dynamics. The first talk this morning uh, describes some molecular dynamics simulation of the system. More or less your force that you, you use to move your particle around is just the negative gradient of this potential energy surface that you're able to build using, uh, uh, after solving the electric Schrodinger equation. For our work, for the kind of system we're interested in, we are going to follow the complete quantum route. That is, we are going to do the quantum mechanical treatment of the motion of the nuclei in the system. So there are more or less two ways of doing it. You can do it uh, by um, solving right away the time dependent on the time dependent Schrodinger equation for the nuclei, or you can use uh, some part uh, integral formalism uh, developed by Feynman and obtain some kind of alternative description of, of quantum mechanics. This theory is, is formally exact, but the application or the implementation usually relies on a lot of approximation that makes it quite often less um, exact than the full Schrodinger uh, treatment of the system. Alternatively, you can also decide to treat some modes or degrees of freedom of the system classically and the rest quantum mechanically. For example, if you have a lot of uh, hydrogen in the system that are much smaller than heavier particles, you can sometimes want to treat those hydrogen using a quantum mechanical formalism and treat the heavier molecule, uh, heavier nuclear using a classical mechanism. And these are also often understood as quantum classical or even in some document as semi-classical methods. So for the work I'm using, like I said, I'm going to First, you solve the Schrodinger equation using quantum mechanical methods. Then you want to solve the motion of the nuclei again using quantum mechanical methods. And for that purpose, I'm going to use a, a formalism that has been implemented in a code called NCTDH, which stands for multi-configuration time-dependent archery. So more or less the idea here is that you want to solve the time-dependent Schrodinger equation. As you know, you have the Schrodinger equation that has a time-independent uh, form and the time-dependent form. So we want to solve the time-dependent form of the Schrodinger equation. And in this specific process, the wave packet that describe the motion of other nuclei all together and express as psi, which depends on time, can be expanded on a basis. So you have your expansion of your wave packet on a basis, which here differ from other ways of expressing this um, or solving this problem by having a basis that is time-dependent as well as the coefficient here that will be time dependent. So the idea is that we want to be able to select only, a, I will call it local, a small number of basis functions that are going to follow the dynamics of the system. Because some processes are quite local 
when you look at the dynamics, you want to be able to use instead of a huge number of basis function, only a small number that are going to follow all the nuclei all together during the process. And those uh, wave functions that are defined and that are time dependent are obtained using a variational principle so that in the end you are able to obtain an uh, equation of motion, not only for the coefficient of your expansion, but also for your various wave functions. So the equations are very complicated, but all over the process is working quite well. And in the end, you have a significant gain by using this type of development. And this can be exhibited by the effort, the medical effort you do when you are uh, solving this type of problem. For example, um, you can look at the memory and requirement when you run a standard time-dependent propagation compared to an MCTA propagation. If you take, for example, a system that has uh, nine degrees of freedom or nine months, depending on how you want to call it, you realize that you, if you use a standard method, I can talk later what is understood by standard method, you will require about uh, 1.5 petabyte and you have about 300 of magnitude less when you decide to use an MCTH format. For that reason, that uh, MCTH method has been um, seen to be the best way of uh, solving this type of problem on this type of system, because it scales well with the dimensionality. I mean, it scales better with the dimensionality of the system compared to other standard methods. And it gets you, it makes you save a lot of memory and allows you to treat a lot of problem what is even more interesting is that the method has been implemented in a, a very nice computer code um, that is more or less open access uh, for everyone. So the issue when you want to solve the problem quantum um, dynamically, one of the main issues is that you have to deal with big integral. And this comes essentially from the fact that you are solving the try to solve the time dependence for the gain equation. So you have to compute a multidimensional integral. And the computation of multidimensional integral can become very time consuming if you are dealing with a huge system. So usually the potential energy form that you need is multidimensional function. Let's say, for example, you have a system that has a, a 12 degrees of freedom. You have to do a 12 dimensional uh, integral. So the way we can go around that is to express that potential is what is known as a sum of product form. That is, you expand potential in a sum of one-dimensional term. In that case, when you have to perform the 12 dimensional integral, you instead have to perform a lot of one-dimensional integrals that are much more cheaper. It's some kind of applying a log scale on the cost you will have to spend on performing this uh, type of multi-dimensional integral. However, transforming this uh, system in this specific model is not always straightforward, so I have a few ideas on how to do it. Uh, for example, um, they are already in the code that have been using some technique to transform the potential when the system is not, uh, has, doesn't have too many degrees of freedom into this specific sum of product form. There are also other possibilities of uh, having someone who provide you the potential energy surface already in the sum of product form that is convenient for your description. And the last part, which is um, current day's a research project is how to use this kind of on the fly description of the potential so that you are still able to solve the dynamics by, by generating the, the potential only every time step. So this is something that is a lot, a little more involved, but what we did for this specific work, we we're dealing with a system that has uh, three atoms. So it's, the dynamics is more or less a three-dimensional uh, 3D dynamics. We simply have used the code that was already provided and transform the system into that specific uh, sum of product form. So now we have our main framework, our main tool, and we want to be able to study the photoabsorption of uh, this system NO2. So how did we get to this specific topic? Well, how did you get to this specific project? Um, this was suggested from, at, uh, by people that, uh, that contacted people at Sandia National Laboratory. So it's some kind of uh, closed project, but I was allowed to present some of the results from this uh, research. But they were wanted to be able to find a way of compute from first principle the absorption spectrum of the, this uh, nitrogen dioxide at any temperature. 
and we want to be able to validate our prediction against experiments. And in particular, we want to be able to obtain the absorption spectrum between 294 Kelvin and 1300 Kelvin. That's probably the time of temperature that are important for um, combustion studies. Also, they wanted to be able to say, okay, let's say the system is not, does not start in the ground, the vibrational state, but start in some potential excited uh, vibrational state. Can we still give us an idea of what would be the absorption cross-section? And that's because of one uh, type of experiment they were in the process of designing at Sanya National Laboratory. So we started working on the project and there were actually two sides in the, in the project. On the theory side, um, my collaborator in the US produced um, this, uh, the perform electronic structure calculation to obtain the potential energy surface using a very high level of electronic structure, which is uh, called multi-reference configuration interaction. And with this type of method, you are not only able to produce a ground state of the system, but you can produce also several uh, excited states, electronic excited state of the system. Following those computation of potential energy surface, what we did is actually uh, study the dynamics of the nuclei in the system using the code MCTDH in order to produce the absorption spectrum of the molecule at various temperatures. Yes. Oh, okay. On the experimental side, they had more or less two tools. They were performing direct absorption spectroscopy, and the other side, they had a double resonance spectroscopy. So like I said, you can imagine that your system is initially on this ground state. Once you apply, um, you can apply first a laser and put it on some excited state of the electronic ground state. And later you apply a second laser to put the system onto the state for which, in which you want to probe the system. So that's more or less the, the double resonance spectroscopy technique. So here is an image of some of the potential energy surface for the dynamics for this specific system where they had to compute at least four potential energy surface and a few dipole moment and transition dipole moment between various surface. And in particular, the dynamic starts on the ground state, you apply the laser or you, the system absorbs the photon and is projected in one of those three potentially excited states. And then we start following the dynamics on the system as it moves along those uh, various potential states. So one of these states is not coupled to to the others, so we can also decouple the dynamics. So first study the dynamics on one potential energy surface, and then study the dynamics on two coupled potential energy surfaces. So the first idea is since we have to prepare our packet on the ground state, are we sure that the result would be accurate? So we first uh, test the quality of our ground potential energy surface. You can see that between about zero and 7,000 wave number, this is about 0.9 EV. Um, you have uh, an error on almost uh, 70 or 80 uh, vibrational state of about 14 wave number, which is an excellent agreement when you compare theories and computation. So to obtain absorption spectrum, it's more or less an overlapping in a tangent independent formalism. It's almost an overlapping between the ground state wave function on which you applied it at the moment and potentially excited vibrational state, whether they are metastable or they are bound states. But this can be written in the time dependent formalism as the Fourier transform of the autocorrelation function that you obtain in the course of the dynamics of the system. So that's what we did, and we were able to obtain um, the absorption cross-section of the system. So on the right, you can see the overall absorption cross-section. In red, there are experimental data that were produced several um, years or decades ago. And in black is a total absorption cross-section. And you, you compare it also on the left in the low energy range of the system, and you see there is a very good and uh, almost excellent agreement between what is obtained for, from theory and experiment. In particular, I want to point out the intensity of the cross-section. You see those values that are mentioned on the left uh, um, axis are absolute values. So there were no scaling, nothing was done. It's purely a initial result that you are seeing right here. And not only the width of the envelope of the cross-section matches, but you can also see that some of the recurrence on the cross-section, which corresponds to some specific vibrational um, um, recurrence are matching very well. So that testified that the quality of the reference structure calculation were very good, and that was proved by the comparison with uh, experiment. 
And we did the same if you look also in the low energy range on the cross section, you can see that uh, we have the same trend at 670 degree Kelvin with experimental data that are in black compared to the calculation. So we follow exactly the same trend. And you can see clearly from this graph that if you go from 296 Kelvin to 673 Kelvin, we can start seeing some kind of temperature dependence on the, on the system. So one other thing we can get from those absorption cross section is the absorption coefficient of the system. And you see here the absorption coefficient at 669 Kelvin. And you see that the result of our calculation in red matches very well the trend that was uh, planned from experimental data. However, when we start looking at even higher temperature 13, 13 Kelvin, you see that there's some um, difference between the two. And this kind of difference because experiment at this temperature particularly difficult to do. They realized that there were probably some errors, some difficulties in the experimental data they were able to produce. And they decided that maybe they are going to rerun those type of experiments in order to be able to obtain more uh, precise ex uh, data. So this is one way through which you can imagine that theoretical computation can be able to provide data where experiments are not uh, very reliable. Um, because of the difficulty of performing them. So this is one interest and one importance of people of running this uh, simulation and predicting very accurately those um, important data for people in the combustion community. So this is, uh, to summarize what we were able to do, we, uh, a new set of potential energy surface and dipole moment was produced from, for NO2 to study the system at room as well as high temperature. We saw that the ground state is particularly accurate. We only have the 40 window number zero, um, error between the data in the our 7,000 wave number range. And we found an excellent agreement between the cross section of obtained from experiment and from obtained from our simulation. And the small disagreement that we observe at high temperature is a motivation for people like Sandia to rerun the experiment and touch up in something that is more reliable and more accurate, also to probe their, their, their instrument there. So finally, I would like to mention people who contribute to this work. Um, in the US, there was Richard Dawes, um, Ernesto Quinta Sanchez, who are at, uh, in Missouri, David Osborne, who is experimentalist at Sanjia National Laboratory, a collaborator in France, uh, Fabien Gatti, and the funding was essentially from the Department of Energy in the US, but there's also the institutional support uh, for ICTP, uh, University of Rwanda and Government of Rwanda. And this work was covered actually in two institutes, um, here at uh, ICTP IFA and part of it was also covered uh, in Missouri. In particular, I realized that I'm the only one from the, our institute to talk and I will encourage uh, other participants to check the website of our institute. There are many opportunities that come from time to time, like potential seminars, um, research visit, the uh, opportunity, mass opportunity, and some of you can be interested, also look at the people who are working in the institute, you can find some overlapping with your current scientific interest and don't hesitate to email us and don't hesitate to attend our, our events. So I hope also that you'll be able to visit us next year and I guess I'm done for this talk, so thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you, Steph. So we have uh, time only for one question, the rest we will okay. do it. Uh, during the interaction session. So, I mean, you can unmute yourself and ask a question. In Hello. The meantime, yes, please. Yeah. Hi. Um, sorry, I don't know if my question is relevant or not, but I'm wondering if uh, the results of this method is compar comparable with uh, TDDFT methods. Well, um, I've done some tests on another system that is also known using TDGFT and using this type of approach. And they are much more accurate than TDGFT. The only problem is that uh, first using TDGFT, you use GFT to generate your electronic structure. And as I said before, for some in some cases it can be quite accurate. In other cases, it can be quite wrong. So depending on the system, you can get good results, but you can also get wrong results. Here on the other side, we are able to control um, the construction of the potential energy surface, so the electronic structure, but we're also able to control a little better the dynamics of the system. So they can produce results that you obtain on using the two methods, but I will trust a little less to the DFT result than uh, result obtained on this, with this type of approach, at least for small systems. Okay, good, thank you. Yeah.
One more question. Okay, so we will uh, we will continue the discussion on the interaction session. Thank you again, okay. uh, Steve.